Welcome once again, all you inept teens and youngsters, to another chilling episode of What Happened, the show where, Matt, you all scream in terror and anger. Why are you covering until dawn? That game was so dope. It had serial killers, jump scares, Wendigos, and Freddie Mercury. I know, right? It was one of the most well-received horror experiences of the last decade and really seemed like it had the potential to become the next big Sony franchise. Unfortunately, its long and protracted development may have contributed to those dreams being dashed, or in this case, slashed. Some of you may recall that Until Dawn actually started life as a PS triple ballin' exclusive and also exclusively used the Move controllers. Do uh, any of you non-PS VR fans remember those things? Well, wait, do you, do you remember this guy? Anyway, there's plenty of meat on these bones for us to dissect, so grab your flashlights and put on your parkas. It's time to find out what happened to Until Dawn. <laughs> Should've paid more attention in climbing class. So as mentioned, when Until Dawn was first announced for the PS3 all the way back at Gamescom 2012, it was massively different from what would eventually release on the PS4 in 2015. UK-based Supermassive Games had originally envisioned it as a pretty standard first-person horror game. It was originally built around the PlayStation Move and as such would feature hand-based puzzle solving, item collecting, and even gunplay. You could also freely roam around each level investigating scenes at your leisure while using the Move controllers to point your flashlight in whatever direction, similar to Wii horror experiences like Silent Hill, Shattered Memories, and of course, the seminal classic Escape from Bug Island. But before I get ahead of myself, which I sometimes do, let's go back just a bit further. While Supermassive Games is credited as the main studio who developed Until Dawn, it wasn't always so. I had a chance to speak with Graham Resnick, a horror writer who was hired to co-write Until Dawn's script and would also go on to help pen most of their later games. Graham graciously shared some information about the origins of Until Dawn and how they go back even further than most realize. I don't actually know too much about the original origins of the game beyond that it was a title with another studio, possibly first party with Sony, before it ended up at Supermassive. But once it got to Supermassive, the only thing it truly shared with the original version, as far as I know, was a very loose concept. Teenagers, lodge, slash cabin, mountain, horror. Which doesn't seem like a lot to go on, but in 2010, 2011 or so, doing a teen slasher game was definitely something pretty off the beaten path. Supermassive took the loose concept and created their own unique story and set of characters. Digging through footage of the early build that's been floating around out there, and believe me, there's a lot, reveals that at one point, Sony's London Studio logo appeared during the intro, with no sign of supermassives at all. Said London Studio had become specialists in PlayStation accessories, starting with the iToy back on the PS2, and they also shipped a huge amount of move-only games on the PS3, so they, being the original developers, makes total sense. While we don't know exactly why the project was moved around, London Studio had a super packed slate at that time. Dozens of SingStar games, two iPads, a PSVR launch title later on, plus the first three Wonderbook games and shipped them all within a single year. Anyways, they were obviously quite busy, so they need someone else to pass the Until Dawn torch to, hence Supermassive Games. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking Supermassive might not have been the best choice, as up until then, they were best known for various pieces of Little Big Planet DLC, including Sackboy's prehistoric moves, and the fourth Wonder Book game, Walking with Dinosaurs, something I just found out existed. So, with that context, it makes sense that with such a variety of shipped projects, PlayStation Move experience, and their proximity with the London studio via the Wonderbook series, they were a pretty good fit. On top of that, Graham shared with me why he felt Supermassive were the ones who would do Until Dawn's concept justice. 
I can say that once I got to know Will Biles and Pete Samuels and many of the other folks at Supermassive, it was very clear why they were the ones to take on this project. They're huge horror fans, and they were dedicated to making it the best video game a horror fan could want. In the 2000s and early 2010s, horror games and movies were pretty dominated by action, zombies, etc. It was still a big part of horror, but at the time, doing something that was not about action would feel like a movie you could play, seem like a novel concept, and Supermassive was relentlessly passionate about making it work and convincing people it would work, despite a lot of initial skepticism surrounding the project. One of the issues the team encountered in this early PS3 version was that the first person setup wasn't as good as directing the player through the story as a fixed camera setup could be. Players could just walk away from characters who were speaking to them and it wasn't as easy to force players to head in the desired direction. Because of this, Graham told me that the game featured far more quote unquote nag lines and barks, presumably to help pull the player away from looking at suspicious rocks. Graham also shared that he remembers writing over 100 lines of dialogue just for when you blasted a character's eyes with their flashlight. What's more is that this was Supermassive's first big narrative game and they were inheriting a workflow from another studio to boot. Graham recalled how this resulted in him having to use Excel to organize thousands of lines of dialogue and that it was such a massive headache for them that Supermassive actually developed their own proprietary tools for their later titles. Although we're not privy to any technical or programming issues the team might have struggled with, and despite the leaked PS3 gameplay looking really solid, there were still some very big changes coming around the frigid corner. Hello? What's going on out there? By the end of 2013, Until Dawn was essentially finished, and even though it was scheduled to launch on the PS3 by the end of that year, both Supermassive and Sony had remained tight-lipped about its progress. This is because there was a big shift happening behind the scenes, but before this shift could be communicated to the public, news got out to several publications that Until Dawn was getting the metaphorical axe and was being cancelled outright. This is because, that December, Amazon Customer Support sent out an email informing early buyers that their pre-orders for Until Dawn were no longer going to be fulfilled, as they had been told it was being canned. Of course, technically, this was actually completely true. The PS3 version of Until Dawn was being cancelled. That said, fans and reporters began jumping to conclusions, and so Supermassive Managing Director Pete Samuels would pop up to set the record straight. It's clearly not planned to be a 2013 release any longer, and I'm hoping and expecting to be able to say more in the new year, but that's really all I'm able to say right now. With all the money and time already invested, releasing the game as a move-only title on the PS3 in 2014 would have been just as good as killing its cast of 18 to 20-something year olds themselves. Evidently, the decision was made to move the entire project over to the PS4, as it would benefit the type of storytelling they are hoping to achieve. We do know this switch was made easier by Guerrilla Games' proprietary internal engine, which functioned smoothly on both the PS3 and PS4, as evidenced by footage of the leaked prototype build still having residual Killzone 3 assets. So there's probably a fair chance that Guerrilla, at the very least, provided support in the PS3 to PS4 transplant. It also meant that during this time, the once unnamed internal Guerrilla Games engine turned into Hideo Kojima's tech of choice, Decima. With that said, it's crazy that such a massive amount of footage from the unfinished PS3 build leaked onto the internet, and judging from said footage, it looked great and seemed to perform quite smoothly. Therefore, it's fair to assume that the Switch was made for marketing reasons rather than debilitating tech problems. Graham corroborated this for me when I asked if this was the case. Correct, unless there's more to the story than I'm aware, this has always been my understanding. It feels a little weird to see it listed sometimes as a cancelled game when really it just had a midstream metamorphosis. Work never properly stopped on it or anything. The PS4 technology made it possible in a way that felt much more in line with Until Dawn's concept, so it was reworked in every way that could take advantage of that. 
With the big delay, this meant Supermassive can now take the time to see what it could improve in the switch to the PS4, with the biggest one being the game's perspective. I think there were two main things that shifted the narrative in that regard and drove the redesign, moving away from first person into fixed camera angles, which allowed the narrative to be told through shots and edits, which is much more cinematic than the free roam first person, and the high resolution facial capture, which allowed Larry and I, as writers, to express ideas and thoughts exactly how we would in a movie, by letting the actors' performances do the heavy lifting that only they can do. I also asked Graham about something every studio and game developer knows all too well, the dusty regrets of the cutting room floor. Between all the different builds of the game, the hundreds upon hundreds of pages of dialogue and mid-development console swapping, some things had to be dropped or simplified. One such element that Graham was sad to see go was the game's 3D TV support, a feature that Sony had been pushing hard near the twilight years of the PS3 and a feature that they dropped just as hard when the 3D TV bubble burst. In terms of content, one big change was the opening scene, which focused on Hannah and Beth. It was originally much longer and more drawn out, but they felt ultimately that it hurt the pacing of the game a bit, so the sequence was cut down to the bare essentials. Ashley, one of the more inquisitive and serious characters seen in the final version, also started out as pretty much an entirely different person. In the PS3 version of the game, Ashley was an overly anxious, workaholic pill popper who had a vivid, nearly split personality persona straight out of Agatha Christie named Mrs. Merriweather, who she would recede into under duress. Ashley would of course lose the split personality during the subsequent rewrites, though Graham also explained that in general, many of the characters who were a bit too over the top were adjusted to make for a more grounded cast. Well, as grounded as these characters could be. Oi, 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 oi. Hashtag there's a freaking ghost after us! Crack a dictionary much, biatch? Looky, looky. Who's gonna fire up some nookie? Speaking of characters, when the game moved over to the PS4, performance capture was making massive strides in producing even more nuance and believability within the medium, and wanting to leverage that further, much of the PS3 cast was replaced with actors who fans might better recognize. Brett Dalton of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and, um, uh, until Dawn fame was one of the few that were retained during the Switch. In an interview with Comic Fine, he remembers the experience rather fondly and recalls a particularly intense audition process. The story with that is that they held legit auditions. It wasn't just a voiceover thing. You were actually using the space, all of that stuff. They were throwing things at you during the audition. I, I want to say just throwing ideas, but I felt like, and maybe I'm just misremembering this, but I think they actually did throw things. Uh, maybe it was just ideas like, oh, there's a deer head now coming at you. When I asked Graham about this, he said, chuckling, I cannot confirm or deny that any deer heads, living or dead, were thrown at the actors. When Until Dawn was finally re-unveiled to the public, the glow up to the PS4 was, needless to say, rather stunning. The extra two years of development overhauling the facial capture, the graphical fidelity, and the cinematic presentation really helped it stand out in an era where Telltale was still the standard for choice-based narrative games. It also didn't hurt that it no longer required players to buy a set of move controllers to play it. Um, just a new console, which is somehow still a better deal? When it was released in August of 2015, reviews were pretty positive, maintaining a 79 average on Metacritic with over 100 reviews in addition to an even higher user score, with the only negatives being... Emily! <laughs> Fans really got into the story and characters, and the well-executed twists and turns really elevated the experience for many. Very quickly, Until Dawn found an unexpected, almost viral popularity on both Twitch and YouTube, despite being positioned as more of a mid-tier summer release. It seemed at that time like Supermassive and Sony had an absolute hit on their hands. The game would place 7th in the August NPD charts, with Sony's then-president Shuhei Yoshida proclaiming it a sleeper hit, while Supermassive's own Pete Samuel said it surpassed their expectations. 
Although specific credible worldwide sales data for Until Dawn isn't really available. It seemed both publisher and developer were satisfied with its performance, but it is curious that there was never any braggy press releases or tweets trumpeting its success. Sony and Supermassive continued to work together on a number of titles, like Hidden Agenda, which was probably the most interesting game in Sony's ill-fated Playlink program, and three all-new VR games, the less-than-ideal Bravo Team, the well-received rail shooter Until Dawn Rush of Blood, and the less-than-well-received The Inpatient. Bravo Team staff would eventually speak out in a Eurogamer article about how Until Dawn's success had the studio management suddenly imposing all sorts of arbitrary changes for the game in order to chase the so-called Hollywood realism that had brought them success with Until Dawn. Beyond that, there's a rumor that Supermassive were recently working on a Killzone VR game, but that Sony handed the game off to another studio due to dissatisfaction with the project. And uh, that's pretty much it for Supermassive and Sony's partnership. Namco Bandai, meanwhile, proceeded to repeat their legally distinct successor series to a surprising Sony hit title by signing Supermassive over to a lucrative eight-game contract for the Dark Pictures anthology. Outside of that, the studio would also find the time to make the smaller-scale Shattered State, as well as the even closer to Until Dawn horror title, The Quarry. As for why Sony never saw fit to release a more traditional Until Dawn sequel, well, Graham chimes in once more. I don't have all the details on the ins and outs, but I think the game did very well, well enough to get those spin-offs greenlit at least. Lack of a literal Until Dawn 2 could be for a variety of reasons, but it's Sony's IP, so in the end, it's not something Supermassive could control. As for the future of Until Dawn, well, recent rumors have swirled about a possible remake of the game, but otherwise, we don't really know anything concrete. That said, Supermassive is still absolutely in the business of providing fans with what they've come to expect, and while their newer horror titles haven't quite hit the same highs as the original Until Dawn did in 2015, the studio's love for the genre obviously managed to stay alive. Graham Resnick, meanwhile, looks back on the last decade of working on horror games extremely warmly, saying, There is literally nothing, nothing better to me as a writer than knowing that there are people out there who quote slash meme the insane stuff I made up late at night on a drunk Skype session with Larry, or put Jesus hot sauce Christmas cake on a t-shirt, or climbing class, or peanut butter butter pops. It's truly bananas and really does make spending millions of hours of my life writing 5,000 to 10,000 pages of hot nonsense per game totally and completely worth it. Thanks again so much to Graham for taking the time to talk to me about Until Dawn. And if you out there know of any other games or movies you'd like me to slash up next, let me know in the comments below or brave the dank mountain cave that is my Twitter. See you next time and thanks for watching.